wanted to say a little bit of an introduction regarding uh, the committee's charge. There's been a little bit of confusion about it. Um, the school board uh, set up the facilities committee uh, and gave it a job basically to create a permanent improvement plan or a renovation plan. At, uh, and in the charge, we said um, it would be important to prioritize needs and to give us renovation plans at different price points. Um, I feel very good uh, because we're doing what the community has asked us to do, which is to consider for the school district to consider and develop a renovation plan. Now, this doesn't mean this is what the school district will ultimately do, but we need that to, as a comparison, that's what the community has asked for. And I also want to say I feel really encouraged uh, as, we begin, as we begin to refine costs provided by the maintenance plan advisor and consider the draft drawings developed by our architect, um, uh, that we're kind of, we're really getting into the, the meat of the issue now. Uh, I did want to say the drawings are responding to uh, what the principals and the administration have requested. It's not a plan that was put together by this committee um, or by the school board. So I say this because we also will need to consider costs and what the community, community will support. Um, we're going to start out by hearing from our architect, Mike Brucely. He's going to go over his plan. And then uh, I can look. And then we will have questions, comments from the table. And then I will take questions and comments from from the citizens. I ask that everybody who speaks, including the people at the table, first time you speak, to introduce yourself because I know people don't know each other that well. Um, and if you're on the committee, to explain, you know, in one sentence, say why you're on the committee. Um, and that's that's it. And there's already a question. I know. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> it's just really hard to hear. And okay. Everybody could just project their voice as well okay. as possible. I know we've turned on the fan and that helps a lot, but yeah, it, I don't know. I'm okay. struggling. All right. Um, put your hand up if you notice you're having trouble hearing, and we'll just try to we'll try to do better. Okay. I'll try to keep an eye out. Okay. Mike. Great. Right. Thank you. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. 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 something that was in the charge and I think the committee is all there but I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page and that we stated it for the public one of the things that we were going to consider was renovations over time by using a permanent improvement and doing multiple projects over multiple years um, and I believe that option has pretty much been ruled out the, the needs are too great and too soon um, and we're looking to add a renovation project that addresses them in, in one large project. That doesn't mean that the project wouldn't be in phases, but it's one funding for one project as opposed to a permanent improvement and doing it over 10 years or more. So it, uh, is the committee all on the same page as far as that goes? Okay, so, so that's all I really have. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. And I think because have to just one comment that means that the language that we had on the charge of the committee that called for a comprehensive permanent improvement plan this is not really what we're doing anymore because we can't phase in with civil fundings here so that's really a renovation plan that we're looking at
Thank you. So this is Mike Brucely, our architect. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mike Richley with Richley Architects and tonight I'm going to present um, a little bit of background on the timeline and the process I went through just to bring everyone up to speed uh, and then also walk, walk through the renovation edition floor plan uh, concept and then walk through a budget uh, to support that at multiple price points. Um, so first I'd like to start and I'm not going to uh, read this slide but I just want to walk through the process uh, I, I went to get here. So, Moats Engineering was selected through an RFQ process to be the main <coughs> advisor for the District of Facilities Committee meeting. And it was um, quickly understood by the group that um, while they do great engineering work, there's some educational adequacy pieces, there's some issues around security, um, student experience, uh, quality of space that really needs to be kind of a parallel process that looked at in conjunction with uh, Mike's work. So uh, I was onboarded for that in the summer and started to look at um, uh, helping to create a vision for what an addition renovation plan could look like. Uh, so to get to that point, I first uh, started meeting with the principals, uh, listening sessions, clean sheet of paper, uh, walked the building with them space by space, photographed and listened to what uh, I heard their needs were. Uh, and then I responded to that with a um, kind of an issues drawing, a drawing that identifies uh, constraints, issues around the existing buildings they have. Um, and then uh, I uh, listened to kind of their vision of, of how it could be or what are things that could happen here to make improvements. And I came back with a first draft of an additions renovation plan, uh, met with the principals again, and we had a second work session, went through that, got some comments, and then made some revisions to that. That was then reported out directly to the committee. Then there was a parallel presentation directly to the school board with that, that uh, same first draft. Uh, and then I've, I've gone back, um, I lost my screen. Um, I, I, the the uh, principals did a staff survey for some staff input uh, to the plan and they received a, a variety of, of input comments on that. So we went back and did a third work session with the principals to say, okay, what are these issues? Do we need to incorporate and address, incorporate the plan? Those were picked up, and the plans that you have tonight all kind of went through that, that process, that three work session, three work session process uh, with the principal, superintendent, and getting staff input. So now it doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, if this were to ever get approved and move into a formal design process, there's a lot more design and input that would need to be taken into, into account. Um, however, for kind of where we are in the process of planning, um, perfect. Uh, so anyway, that's that's background. If anyone wants to see the dates, the kind of timeline of exactly when all those meetings happen, uh, it's up here on the screen. Um, I developed uh, existing floor plans of each of your schools. And this is your existing conditions at Mills Lawn Elementary. Um, I'm going to just kind of work through this quickly because the committee has seen this before. If anyone wants to slow me down or, or ask a question, please do so. And uh, then for Mills Lawn, this is the issues drawing I mentioned where kind of in red highlighted uh, <coughs> portions of the building that needed to be addressed whether it was uh, security issues, whether it was reconfiguration of space, um, the modulars, renovation of restrooms, etc. And then this is the existing high school floor plans, uh, first floor, and then second floor and third floor on the lower right. And then same thing, an issues drawing, working around the school. And those all led up to um, uh, these proposed renovation addition plans. Uh, the areas in yellow represent additions. Uh, this addition off the back of Mills Lawn uh, is two music rooms and an art room. Uh, the second addition is a new kitchen. And there's a third small addition, which is an extension of the corridor, which helps some circulation uh, in and around the library to classrooms. Uh, areas shown in blue were recommended for deep renovation. 
and by deep renovation I mean um, all envelope issues addressed, all systems addressed, and all finishes and all furniture addressed. Uh, and then the areas in gray, um, a good portion of those are the 2002 edition, and those are uh, the portions of your building that are in the best shape. Uh, the, the areas shown in gray are um, characterized as targeted systems improvements. So we still need to address the entire envelope, and we still need to address the systems. Um, but these classrooms, if you've ever been into the new ones, don't need quite the level of, of work uh, as the 1950s portion. Uh, there's also a, a drawing below, and I will add um, the change that happened between uh, 2.0 and 3.0 is in the 3.0 uh, variation of this. Um, the fourth, fifth, and third grade and flex classrooms uh, around the media center were added uh, into the deep renovation scope. And then uh, beyond that, there were some, well, kind of minor uh, space name designations, offices reconfiguration, just to help with some of the, uh, the workflow. And the second drawing I'll show you is the high school edition renovation plan. Uh, again, the yellow represents uh, additions. And on, on this side of the building, that would be a, a new office with a new secure vestibule, a new choir theater room, and a new uh, band room. This option would um, require the demolition of the existing band room based on how far that addition uh, goes out. And then over on the other side is the construction of new classrooms uh, and the removal of the modular in this vision, the, um, what they call the shoebox. And then the areas in blue again are recommended areas for deep renovation. Those include things like the kitchen, expansion of the kitchen, removal of the kiva, removal of the French classroom out here, um, and expanding the student serving area, moving up through the floors on the second floor, adding large group restrooms, which will help tremendously with the flow because the students are having to come all the way down to the first floor, a reconfiguration of the third floor, turning the tower into the middle school, uh, and then one other thing I'll point out is uh, the, the renovation and expansion of your large group restrooms here on the first floor, uh, which are too small. So those are some of the highlights. Um, so kind of what everyone's been waiting for is kind of the first round of the budget uh, that considers this. And after discussion with the committee, uh, the direction we went was to try to provide a comprehensive and simple kind of one sheet budget for the entire addition renovation plan vision, but also kind of bifurcate it and have a what we call a foundational plan and then the balance required to do the whole thing. And the concept of this really came from the tour we did of, of Oakwood City Schools, which had a kind of a foundational approach, a more pragmatic approach, where they addressed envelope systems and deep renovation of restrooms, so kind of targeted renovation. They call that a foundational plan, and that became uh, kind of what was, what was done there. The, the thought or the idea on a foundational plan is it can be built upon. Deep renovations can follow, um, additions can follow, but it's, it's kind of the, the starting point or the genesis of the plan. So when we talk about the numbers tonight, you'll see a column, uh, that's, that's a foundational plan cost, and then we have, we'll have another column which is additional work for the full uh, renovation plan uh, that you see in front of us tonight. So I'm gonna dive right into this. And this sheet is the 11 by 17 document. <laughs> okay, a lot of people always zoom in on my computer to work this. So this is the one sheet, and the way this is organized is the uh, Bills on Elementary is in the blue up top. Middle school, high school is in the green below. And then you can see the columns labeled foundational renovation plan. You can track those to the bottom and see subtotals per school. And you'll see the column that says additional work for the full renovation plan. You can 
can see subtotals for those, and then the composite, uh, the total of both, uh, in both schools and the grand total in the bottom right. So with that, I would just like to go line by line through this and explain this. Um, the drawings are also a companion piece to this, so as this relates to portions of the plan, I'll, I'll point those out uh, for the committee. Uh, line item number one, uh, starting with Mills Lawn, is hazardous material abatement. And as part of this process, there was not an environmental engineer hired to look at that in detail. So we relied on the 2001 OCC assessment report where they came through and uh, did an assessment of hazardous materials for, for both schools. So this is the background uh, for that. And the way we just assigned it for this proposal was we said 50% of the abatement would happen in the foundational plan and 50% of the abatement uh, would happen in the additional work piece. Uh, I will say that this is um, uh, work that would need to be followed up on if a renovation plan was seriously considered to see if 50% if is probably not the right split. There's probably a more accurate split to say what type of abatement needs to happen in the foundation plan versus uh, the future plan. However, I wanted to at least acknowledge that uh, we need to get dollars in here for hazardous material abatement uh, in, this, in this project. Uh, I have square footages for everything, which kind of helps on order of magnitude. So you can just see $5.53 uh, for the entire Mills Lawn associated uh, with that foundational piece. Uh, also, uh, item number two is the demolition of the modular. There seemed to be unity, uh, not, not unity around everything, but definitely unity around that, that at Mills Lawn, uh, that mo uh, modular needs to be uh, removed from the site. So that was included uh, here as item two in the foundational plan. And then item three uh, was the THP envelope. And Michael, if you're all right, I will uh, kind of introduce this, but maybe let you talk through those numbers. You okay with that? Sure. Okay. You can put them up here. Yeah, uh, I can. Actually, I can. I have it here. <laughs> okay. So the THP report is on this double-sided 11 by 17. And on one side is Mills Lawn, and on the other side is the middle school, high school. So uh, the backup for this item three is on the spreadsheet. And uh, Mr. Murdoch, do you want to take it from here? Sure. So um, my name is Mike Murdoch. I'm with Moats Engineering. And uh, uh, I had responsibility to evaluate all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and structural engineering issues associated with the existing conditions. Um, so uh, the spreadsheet you're looking at was generated by a consulting engineering firm out of Cincinnati, uh, THP is the name of the firm, and they performed a uh, thorough evaluation of the building uh, for structural elements, envelope elements, so we're talking roofs and windows, doors, um, and the like there on the envelope and then structural, all the concrete, columns, uh, brick and mortar, uh, anything uh, that would be a structural element. So when they went through here, they identified uh, a quantity of square feet and a cost per item and identified um, a, a calculated total cost and how much that item would cost to repair. So if you look at the very top, you, you're, I know I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, Lawn. Yeah, um, the elementary school Mills Lawn. Um, if you look at the very top, he's, he talks about concrete, um, the original construction concrete, you know, 225 square feet. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but um, he breaks it down into 112 square feet for original and then another 113 for classroom administration. And he identifies what he thinks the cost to do that is. He includes uh, not just the unit cost, but general conditions. So if a contractor comes in, he's got to set up a fence, he's got to clean up and, and move his tools. He's, there's a, a, a profit, uh, AE, uh, that's architectural and engineering fees, um, and then inflation. Um, so we identified, we looked at all those costs, and we tried to break out what we thought was something that had to happen 
right away, had to be involved, uh, had to occur in the next 12 months. That was either a safety condition or a structural element that if it failed, it was going to cause a problem for the school's uh, function. Um, and then what could be delayed for uh, one to three years, and then what could be delayed three to five years. So kind of broke them up into that bucket. And do we have that on here? Yeah, we do. So on the far right, you see what we consider the first priority in the next 12 months, and that, that equates to $415,000 uh, worth of repairs. And then the second priority is 12 to, 12 to 36 months, that equates to $1.1 million. And then um, third priority, 36 to 60 months, uh, is $2.8 million. Um, so structural elements, um, all these have to be addressed in a renovation, they all have to be addressed. Uh, some are more urgent than others. Uh, the one thing about a structural element, though, is you delay it, it gets worse and worse and more expensive. At some point, uh, if water gets into brick or block and, and is allowed to freeze and thaw, it will destroy it. And so we're at that point, in some cases, where we have some serious conditions that need to be addressed in the short term, 12 months. Um, um, you know, we also kind of prioritize these based on the reality that there's probably a renovation project coming. And if that renovation project occurs, some of these things would be delayed until you have a contractor and then he would do uh, a significant portion of the work in the, the either first or second phase of the work. Um, so, for example, roofing, you know, I wouldn't have you run out and patch the roof up in the next 12 months if you're going to tear it all off and replace it the next two years, right? So it would be a function of what's the best use of the dollars um, and to either delay if you have a renovation coming or, or put things in a specific order so that you avoid any permanent damage. So um, he, we, we, we evaluated this for both Mills Lawn and then at the, at the other side is the uh, high school. Um, and I can talk about any specific issue, but the yellow highlight is the yellow highlight for you. The, some of the items were highlighted, and we identified those. Um, some of the uh, specific, maybe you took those out of there, the highlights. Did you? Okay. Um, we looked at certain conditions that may not be required if the shoebox is removed. So there is certain items that are associated with the shoebox and if, if it's demoed you don't have to do those things if you intend to keep it then those costs are in there so we can isolate those shoebox costs and so you understand the significance of that um, so i don't know if you want to go into any details about any block or brick or columns or roof or parapets or safety issues are, are there okay so so at this point are you going to go back to this list? I, I mean, okay. So there are going to be questions and comments, I'm sure. But what do you think is the best way to do it? Should we keep going? I probably we'll should keep going yeah. and then okay. open it up. Okay. Um, so thank you, Mike. Um, the way this was organized on this budget is the THP envelope items at <laughs> one point five two six for Mills Lawn represent first priority and separate priority, or second priority the columns in total. So that the 1.5 million equals the sum total of Mills Long THP list, priority one and priority two. And then priority three is, is uh, next door, which we'll get to in a second. But the largest item is item number four, which I called a moats full system replacement. Uh, $120.95 a square foot. And this also keys in below to kind of the backup of what like, makes up that 128. And again, Mike, do you want to just give us a quick sure. going down of these items? So in the course of um, our, our role, we inspected all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, security, IT, AV, furniture, uh, and roof finishes and identified um, what we considered equipment that needed to be replaced in the time frame. So in our, our uh, maintenance study, 
we have a list of like for like replacements. So if your boiler goes out, we replace it with a boiler. If your uh, pump goes out, we replace it with, with the pump. So we identified that cost, but that doesn't get the, um, the building where uh, it probably needs to be. So this, this identifies um, essentially replacing all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection systems in, or adding fire protection. Uh, fire alarm and other systems in the building. So this is a full replacement um, HVAC system to be determined. We would not probably go back with the system that you have. We'd probably go back with a different, more efficient system. Uh, controls, you don't really have controls. You have the spotty on some of the equipment. Um, this would replace uh, all the underground plumbing and storm piping, as well as all the toilets, all the handicap space, and completely new bathrooms. Um, it would replace all your hot water. It would replace the grease trap and kitchen waste system. Um, and uh, it would add a fire suppression system to both, to, to both buildings, um, including a fire pump and pump controls. Um, it would replace all the lighting, all the electrical um, distribution, all the power outlets, uh, IT outlets, uh, brand new fire alarm, um, and then you know full technology. And then um, ceilings, and ceilings are in there. So replacing all the, the ceiling tile, um, because the, the work above ceiling would be so invasive that ceiling tile, in most cases, would probably be destroyed. And a lot of the ceiling tile is the old spl hidden spline tile that you can't really take apart. This tile you could potentially take apart, stack the tile somewhere in the, in the grid, and reassemble it if you wanted to. But, uh, typically it's faster and easier and cheaper to, Replace them. So, thank you, Mike. So that's item uh, back up to Mills Swan. That's item four at one hundred and twenty-eight, nearly one hundred twenty-eight dollars a square foot. Next up in, in the foundational plan is an addition, and this one's listed as part one of three for the arts edition, and that's edition A on the art side. So if we flop over the, the drawings. Uh, this is edition A. And in total, this edition is 5,480. But in the foundational plan, uh, we're saying we would just add one art room and the associated corridor with it to replace, I'm sorry, one music room, to replace the music room that is lost in the demolition of the modular. Right? So this is the foundational plan. We lose something, uh, we, we get it back. And so back to the budget. Um, that's why this is broken out here is Arts Edition A, part one of three, the uh, instrumental room plus the corridor, 1,745 square feet, uh, $450 a square foot. I will add that um, the schedule that we're conceiving is a, a fall of 23 bond issue, I believe at the earliest. I know that hasn't been decided, but it's important for these numbers because that means our bid event would not be until 2024. So here we're in late 2022 trying to predict construction costs of 24. So $450 um, sounds really high, uh, and, and it is. Um, we've experienced incredible construction cost escalation. Uh, the states, uh, which is kind of sets the standard, um, saw a 17% jump from 21 to 22, and the jury's still out about what's happening in 22. So uh, these additions, unfortunately, are getting more, more expensive, but the $450 represents our best guess today of what this could cost in a 2024 bidding event. So that's uh, $785,000 for that first room. And, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the way we tried to break this budget out is I'm sure there's many in the room saying, well, how much would it cost if I just took another did another music room or did another art room. So we, we separated these all out in hopefully such a way that allows the committee to make easy work of kind of determining their own scope or considering the cost of, of other parts and pieces. Um, and the only other scope we have identified is in the K2 wing, uh, a secure vestibule in the office and restroom renovation, and I'll, I'll point that out. So while the, uh, the overall master plan envisioned 
you know, a full renovation of, of everything on that uh, east wing. What's proposed to be funded in the foundational plan is the creation of a new secure vestibule and a reconfiguration of all the office space required to support it. <coughs> Secretarial area, reception area, where the principal's offices are positioned, uh, some staffing reconfiguration to kind of bring the staff together. Uh, that's included. Uh, and then also the second piece that's included, which we really felt was foundational, is a full gut and replacement of the large group restrooms in that K2 way. Uh, it's time and they really need it and it felt like a foundational plan that didn't address that uh, would, from our perspective, would be missing the mark uh, for certain. So when we go back to the budget here, you'll see uh, $50 a square foot applied to that entire blue area gives us uh, approximately a million dollars to work with, which would uh, be sufficient budget to do that entire office redo, creation of the secure vestibule and a uh, a gut and replacement of those restrooms. Uh, and so in total, uh, that represents a, a total square footage of 49,125 square feet when we're done, because we're taking the existing building and we're adding on to it. Uh, it represents a just a, approximately $200 square foot investment uh, into that building at about $9.7 million. And then right next door, is, uh, and I'll just keep going here before I jump schools. Uh, this is again the column that says what additional monies would need to be invested to come up with this entire uh, plan that's on paper. So back up to the top, we have the remaining 50% of the uh, material, hazardous material abatement. Uh, next item three, we have the priority three THP envelope issues. This one's at $2.8 million, and, and Mike, I believe this is a lot more expensive because the roofs are, are all, the roofs weren't immediate uh, needing a replacement, but the roofs are tucked into this one. Uh, the addition part two and part three, um, that would be, part two of this addition would be uh, creating, say, either the second music room, or this could be an art room, kind of interchangeable. And then the part three would then be either that third art room or the music room. So that's where you see um, addition A, parts two of three and parts three of three showing up in this column. The storm shelter hardening. So the, uh, the state had a, a state law that was a moratorium on storm shelters. Storm shelters are a requirement for educational facilities that house all the students and all the teachers and what they call an ICC 500 compliant storm shelter uh, designed to withstand uh, 250 mile an hour winds, if I'm correct, uh, with, along with all their mechanical systems and structure to, to support it. Um, in this proposal, uh, I'm saying that until we build a sufficient amount of new construction to house the student population, uh, there's really no way to get that storm shelter into that foundational phase. This is to be determined, would need to be discussed with the jurisdiction of authority to see if it's okay, to see where the storm shelter fits. But for today's discussion, I have the storm shelter at an added $150 a square foot. So that's $150 a square foot on top of the $450 a square foot to build um, the buildings for the hardening. Oh, the structural hardening, mechanical systems hardening, um, the restrooms that you have to have out there, uh, et cetera. So that's the, that's the storm shelter uh, showing up there on the, the second phase. Uh, the kitchen addition shows up here, as well as the, uh, the kitchen equipment. And then that small uh, corridor extension, what I'm calling addition C, is also line item 11. Line item 12 is the balance of the renovation of the K2 wing. So this would be going back through that wing. We had a, a wall we were removing to create an extended learning area. We were reprogramming and shuffling around some spaces, all new finishes, all new furniture uh, in the K2 wing. And then uh, also is on the 3-5 wing, $150 a square foot in addition to the moat systems cost to do all the uh, finishes, the casework, uh, the flooring, the walls, um, uh, 
furniture in, in those areas. And we have a site work allowance, item 14 of $250,000, and that recognizes that if an addition is put on the back, that there's going to need to be some reconstructuring of the, the roadway, because we have bus drop off back there, we have service entry, and um, that interferes with the footprint of the addition. So there's some site work allowance that just recognizes um, that we're going to need to deal and address with that uh, revised vehicular drop-off. Uh, and then the last item I'll note up here is, um, it's shown blank, but it's called swing space. And this is uh, another conversation. Swing space is an accommodation that needs to be considered in any renovation plan. The deeper the renovation, the more swing space is important. Um, some districts uh, try to um, to not lease modulars and utilize existing underutilized spaces and shuffle students around during a phased renovation. That's very typical. Or in other cases, we're bringing in and leasing modular units for, say, a year. So you could house a certain number of classrooms out in a modular unit and then cycle through the renovations quicker in the building. Um, there's also discussions I've heard about off-site locations, different building locations that, that may come into play. So <coughs> this is on the list to acknowledge that this isn't going to be zero, uh, but, but determining what it is is going to take some work, either by understanding how deep the renovation scope is or understanding what kind of opportunities might be out, out there in Yellow Springs to support. Uh, so uh, the, the second phase adds another $193 a square foot, and the, um, the total is $373 a square foot for a $20 million total on that building. And, and I know a lot of folks have asked, well, how much would a new building be? And <coughs> the math is pretty easy. You could just use a $450 a square foot figure for a new building, and you can see the renovation, even the total renovation should be south of the total cost uh, of a new building, not including any kind of uh, state credit. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. Sure. Um, the, the total investment on this spreadsheet for all the work identified in the master plan uh, budgeted is $373 a square foot. If you're going to go build a new 54,195 square feet today, if you're going to go build that same square footage in new at $450 a square foot, my, my point was that would cost more than the full renovation. Not including the swing space. Uh, not including the swing space and also not including a potential state credit if uh, the district were participating in a uh, state funded program. So, I'll, I'll comment. Sure. Once again. Okay. Okay. All right, let's jump down to the middle school, high school. I might be able to go a little bit quicker because it's a, a similar format. Uh, but line item 16, hazardous material abatement, same thing. We'll have to see report uh, at 50%. 50% in each of the buckets. Um, the, the shoe box, which we call, um, in the foundational plan stays, it's not demolished, and the band room would stay in this foundational plan. Uh, the THP envelope options, or not options, but recommendations, which is, again, THP's list of their priority one and priority two items off their spreadsheet uh, is $3.3 million in the foundational phase. That's a $45 square foot investment for all the envelope issues. Moats is full uh, system replacement. All the items uh, Mike mentioned on Mills Lawn uh, would apply here. The cost per square foot is slightly different due to boilers, I believe, cost of the boiler. So $127 a square foot invested in a full systems upgrade uh, uh, to the Mills Lawn High School. Addition A, part one of four, uh, the office. So if we go over to the drawings and look at addition A, uh, the foundational proposal says we would just build the office area and the secure vestibule area in that foundational phase. So the square footage is 
with just this portion. And then the square footage for the choir theater room, uh, the storage space in between, and the instrumental room uh, are assigned to the, the second phase. Does the office include the entire, that entire square, the secure vestibule? It does. Plus? Okay. And the same with the grade school? Yes. Yes. Uh, renovation of the first floor at $50 a square foot for $862,000. Uh, the scope of this would be the, the, the full on gut expansion and replacement of the restrooms on the first floor. So we'd be dealing with that issue kind of at, at both schools. Uh, and then also kind of reconstruction and, and reprogramming and, and finishing off this administrative area because we're moving some of the administrative components up front and it would just allow us to, to kind of complete all of that together. So that is, uh, that is what I mean here by the $50 square foot renovation of that first floor. Uh, and then also the, the targeted renovation would be on the second floor of the tower, adding the large group boys and girls and faculty restroom, again, in that foundational phase. Meaning these were, these were issues as we communicated with your, your staff board, literally you know, kind of at the top of the list in terms of how the building is functioning. Site work allowance we put up into this first phase because that that addition for the office is going to encroach on the vehicular drop off. So we're, there's some dollars uh, that are applied to that phase to reconstruct, realign uh, that that entry. And then over into uh, the second phase of the high school, we have the balance of the abatement costs. Uh, this is the column where we uh, demolish the shoebox, we demolish the band room, we do the priority three THP envelope items, and then we pick up the choir room, the instrumental room, uh, the second floor storage area above that, and then also the storm shelter hardening. This is this plan we would envision the large choir and band room to serve as your hardened uh, storm shelter for this building. Um, the renovation on the first floor, which is everything in blue, I didn't just describe. In other words, everything except for the, the restroom renovation. So this would be things like um, the renovation of the kitchen, um, relocation of the French room. Um, there's some vision about opening up this wall with maybe some garage doors or movable walls to, to renovate uh, this whole area would be included uh, in that piece. Kitchen equipment at $190 a square foot is also added here. And then the tower renovation of the second floor and the third floor. So this would be the third floor in total, and this would be the second floor added uh, beyond the restrooms that I mentioned previously. So 14.7 in that phase, and when we see the grand total uh, at, the, at the high school, that's 30 million at $382 a square foot gives us a grand total of the 50.6 million for the full meal deal of, of everything on the drawing. So that completes um, kind of my overview of this and open it up to any questions. Why don't we start out uh, with this long one we do it high school that would be successful to do it. Um, Jay. Um, <clears throat> so, I saw the contingencies that were built into the THP numbers, um, and I'm curious, does that same 10% apply to all aspects of these numbers? Yes, yeah, so the way these are or, um, developed is these are envisioned to be total project costs per line item. So, for example, the $450 square foot for the addition line item 5 would be your all-in number. Contingencies, owner's contingencies, AEPs, soft costs, soil warrants, building permits, everything. And that was important because we, if there's movement on numbers, so column to column, we want you to have the full picture. Um, so like, for example, the hard cost of the $450 square foot would only be about 80% of that. But the soft costs are clumped with it. 
So yes, uh, all the contingencies are built in per line item. Yep. Thank you. Mike, is one of those contingencies designed? Yes. Well, it's not a contingency. It's uh, the architecture and engineering soft fees cost. represent uh, the majority of the soft costs associated with it. Yeah. So the four hundred fifty dollars a square foot would would be sufficient funding to hire an architect and engineer and build it. Jerry, um, I, I have just a couple. One is two are for you, Mike. Would the electric be upgraded to four meter? Yeah. And then um, wind, windows at Mills Lawn one to three years out just because they're not in bad shape. I'm just, I was just confused about that. One to three years out. The Why are we in the second, the second phase? Really? Well, because I put them in that second phase because I assume in a renovation they would be replaced. And not in the first 12 months. But they need to be replaced. They're, they're completely shot. Um, second question for you is in your full replacement costs, mm -hmm. you're um, right you look at these furnishings. Yes. Are any of these furnishings included in the, um, the target? Sections of, I know they're included in the renovation section, but I could not find any loose furnishings down there. I don't think so. You mean in terms of the student furniture? Yes. Um, okay, two, two other, three other things, and they're general. So for Oakwood, and when you explained the Oakwood plan, Mike, you said it was bifurcated because um, that's how they chose to do it. They also were an ELF project and have credit. Is that, is that the reason they could bifurcate their project? Yeah, so if you're an approved ELF district Correct. and the OSFC agrees to allow you to keep your building, Correct. you can do a partial upgrade and get credit for the pieces you do. Okay. So we don't know that. We don't know that. So clarification, and, and I just, I'm saying this not to challenge Mike, but just Mike and I have had this discussion before. I think it's important for everyone to understand that um, as he was costing out, here's the renovation cost for Mills Lawn, here would be what it would cost for a new building, and then you could get an, an ELK credit. In 2017, when the district explored ELK, they were able to get a credit because of enrollment size at each building. And at that time, uh, the Mills Lawn was 374 and the Middle School High School was 383. The threshold, I believe, is somewhere between probably 350. So in the last project, in my conversations with our OMCC consultant, she said, because of our student enrollment and we had not crossed that threshold, that's why a, a single new K-12 was what they would co-fund. We do know that we still qualify. We now qualify for 27%. I just don't want any, anyone to think that we would necessarily qualify for that 27% if we built a new building here and a new building at Mills Lawn. Um, that is all up to the OFCC and there are waivers and, and we don't meet those requirements as is. So I just want to make sure that no one leaves here and says, hey, there's a 27% credit if we just build a new building, a new middle school. Last question. Uh, additional work for full renovation, whether it's Mills Lawn and Middle School High School, when is that? State that question again. Sorry. When does that come after the foundation? So this is. And, and, and was the discussion, and I think this, I don't know if this came up at the Zoom meetings last week because I didn't get through all of the video. But is this part of a um, full, fully funded project that we're just phasing out? Or um, we're doing something other than what we discussed in phasing out? Look, I mean, I could, the committee was asked to provide for the school board, um, uh, well, we were calling it a permanent improvement plan now then and now we're talking about a renovation plan at different price points and that's what we're trying to provide to the community. Right, right. I understand that. Right. But these which means like that which means that some 
renovation plan may have more in it than other renovations. These seem like not two separate renovation plans, mm -hmm. but two parts of a whole. And that's a real difference, and I just want to understand that. Because I thought I heard Jay say, so I'm just trying to, to clarify. Is this, it, do you anticipate this to be a fully funded renovation that just then there's phase one of the actual um, work and then a phase two? Or it's phase one is funded and then we go back and fund phase two? Seems to me that it's a discussion for the school board as to what kind of plan with the community, of course. So am I to look at this as two separate, I guess that's my question. Am I to look at this as two separate renovation separate. plans, or these are two parts they're, they're of two. a whole? The way I'm looking at it is there's two renovation plans here. However, they're not finished because we haven't talked about many of the costs, which when you look at it in detail, there's a lot of questions about. Uh, so that, and then there's a the question of how much would the community be comfortable with? in terms of a bond levy. And then once you've got that number, figuring out you know, what you can accomplish with that amount of money. Um, that's the way I look at it. Um, there's definitely, uh, I sat down with the building folks on the committee last night to look over these numbers because it's pretty complicated. And there's a lot of questions, so I don't think these are the final numbers. Um, well, one question I have that I'd just like to ask right now is in the first report we got from Modes, uh, the fire suppression system and the fire pump and pump control package, which is, you know, fairly expensive, uh, you in your report recommended that we not do that and that we wouldn't necessarily need to do that. And we know Oakwood does not have a sprinkler system. They, they decided not to put a sprinkler system in were able to not put a sprinkler sister system in and they, they did some other uh, improvements to their fire safety system but you had a lot of data showing that things are quite safe without a sprinkler system and so that's so I was surprised to see that full price in here and you had initially recommended you don't need to do that so if, if you do a renovation and it's not um, over a certain percentage of the value of the school. Uh, you can argue with the jurisdiction having authority that we don't want to do sprinklers. Now, they're going to say, well, we want to make sure there's egress, passive egress, et cetera, in the event of a fire, the kids can get out. Not. But you can argue that. If you gut the whole building, they're not going to even talk to you about it. You're going to have to do it. So that was kind of where I was. And based on, you know, go back three months ago or four months ago when we were talking about maintenance plan and what do you have to do and what you you know what needs to happen my recommendation was you don't need to have a sprinkler system this building's been here for a long time very very safe space at school in terms of fire and it's not a real risk so but jurisdictions having authority now today will force you to do it if you go over a certain dollar amount or if they're just blockheads and they risk they want to fight you on it so mm. it's and in terms of your furniture um, we did go through that, and, the, and I have in my spreadsheet, it's about $550,000 for new furniture for the high school. All students, all chairs, and about three hundred and seventy, if you will, for the elementary school. And I, when I went to the, uh, the recent OFC or whatever, that uh, school board thing, I had a couple of furniture guys. Yeah, price for me, so you're in the future. Okay, other questions? Yeah, yeah so I need to back out a moment to understand this. Um, who decided what was part of the foundational and what was part of the additional? Who, who, I, who had input on that? Uh, I mean, I, I'm the one who put the budget together. So yeah. I, I authored this, and it was based on kind of um, a collective feeling about this entire process of, of what was core issues. Uh, core issues from the beginning I heard were envelope, systems, safety and security, and we got to fix these bathrooms. <laughs> Those were kind of the core issues that I heard and I wanted to make sure the foundational plan addressed that. And 
and then also to develop. Um, my job isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily to tell you what to do, but to just give you the information. And I think there's a lot of work left here for, for the committee, the community, the board to start to try to prioritize what is important to do now and what could be deferred. For example, um, there are conversations ongoing about the shoebox. <laughs> You know, they, and on this committee, there are very uh, differing opinions on that, and, and both valid. Um, some saying, hey, it's square footage we have. Why would we make that go away? We can use it for all kinds of things. And then others saying, hey, now is our chance to make that go away and replace it with new, new classrooms. So I try to set this up to not make those decisions necessarily for you, but to give us hopefully a framework for that discussion to continue uh, in, the, in the coming months. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, I guess um, there are some things that don't quite line up for me because I see that the roofs, which I think you've described as being in pretty bad shape. In, in, in certain areas, yeah. In certain, in certain areas. Uh, but also the design of the roofs is faulty. There's, right? there's issues, yeah. And so that you put in what would be a different plan of renovation according to you today, right? So the roofs would not be uh, addressed in the first one. But I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised so, by that. Some pieces of the roof are. The worst places, the worst conditions. Yeah. So I guess uh, this this was my question. Uh, and okay. uh, I, I think uh, we'll get there with that. So Mike was, one of the things, if we look at line four and line 20, the, the full system replacement, um, Mr. Richley pointed out that the high school, that full system, includes a total roof replacement. Um, but that is not part of the full system at the elementary because the elementary roof is not in the same condition as the high school roof, correct? That's correct. But, and there was a debate about what kind of roof to go back. So. It's just at a high level. The numbers here are general. Yeah. All right. Because we don't. If you want to go back with a certain roof, it's twenty dollars a square foot. If you want to go back with a really great roof, it's fifty dollars a square foot. So we're trying to provide a, a reasonable number that will get you a good roof, but not maybe the best roof. Maybe in a good mechanical system, but maybe not the best. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So there. I mean, there may be parts of the middle lawn roofs that are being touched, but. In this plan, there's not a full replacement of the mills along the roof because it's not necessary at this time. Right. Do you have an idea of the lifespan on that roof? It, just, it, it depends on which roof, right? The, oh, the different sections. Yes. Yeah. And um, what we one of the things we were going to do when, when we talked on the phone on our video chat uh, was we were going to get a roofing contractor to do some core on your roofs in various locations to kind of identify what the, the roof structure, the system looks like, how bad is it, is there water? And so we can say, you know what, this roof's great, it'll last another 15 years, we don't have to put it in a number anymore. This roof's shot, we have to do something. And by the way, this is the third layer, and so we have to tear it all off, or the insulation's compressed, we have to tear it all off. So our, our numbers assume the worst. But okay. there was, you know, we were gonna camera underground pump piping, because there's a debate about whether or not the piping is bad or not, and what kind of pipe it is. And, and we don't have any records of anything, so we're making a guess based on what they did in 1950. Uh, we were going to uh, look at um, the piping in the uh, two pipe uh, hot water uh, heating system to see if the pipe's acceptable conditions so we could go back with another hot water system, which would potentially save money. Uh, we are going to look at the electrical system because there's an argument about whether the the old electrical gear could be used for another 20 years or 30 years or if it's if it's done right and so those those were being lined up and so we were going to get some data so I, on that. I, I guess Sorry, for, for, for planning for purposes yeah. I guess I would say you know it, this does not include a full replacement of the elementary roof but probably within 15 years yeah um, and that would probably be ballpark uh, two million 
Well, there's one, some sections that need to be replaced and okay. would have to be replaced in this renovation. And I think there's one area that's what, 20, I don't want to say 2016, I don't know if it's that new, but there's one section that's relatively new. Um, I, I'm sorry, well, guys. No guys. Be. Well, I think that's that's part of the the doing the core sample thing because there's such a thing as a restoration of a roof as opposed to a complete tear off and redo. And there's a lot of there's se there's several roofs that are definitely candidates for the restoration if it's doable, and that's where the core sample thing comes in. So what you do is you do a core sample, and your roofing manufacturer will tell you, yeah, we can restore this roof, and then. We'll Already on the restoration, which is cheaper than doing a complete tear off, yeah. and it's it's conceivable that the main part of the 52 section is would fall under that, um, but we won't know unless we do a core sample. So that's why we need to do core samples on each different section of the roof, um, like the conference room is included in the 2002 section, which all of that should definitely be restorable. Um, so there's, there's there's different, that's why a core sample for all the individual roofs is very important so that you know what you have. As, like we talked about the drains, you know, these numbers um, include salt cutting and Everything. replacing all of that right. stuff. Well, if we don't have to do that, then that changes these numbers for the better. Right. But we don't know that unless we do the camera and shoot it in there. The electrical gear, you know, you, you get an electrical um, expert in there with infrared cameras and they'll, they'll shoot it and they'll, they'll look for hot spots and, and they'll look at the gear and see, yes, you can get uh, more years out of this or no, you can't. So a lot of the things that we need to know soon could affect these numbers greatly. And that's, that's why we're asking that um, these things be done so that we can make an informed decision. I made another comment there. You were asking about replacing all the roofs or not. One of the things we don't want to do is to have all the roofs and all the HVAC changed in the same one or two years. Because if we do that, all the roofs will come up for replacement again in 20 years or 25 years. And then that's a huge amount of money in one bang. Whereas if you have everything phased a little bit, it's going to spread your spend in 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I see the point in that, but also at the same time, if you replace it all at once, you know where it's at, and you know predictably when it's all going to be need to be replaced. Now, well, the H, roofs, I would I, I would totally disagree on HVAC because HVAC systems are all tied together and all the controls are tied together, and piecing together HVAC systems does not work well for large buildings. It, it, it you'll have a piece that works and 90% of it that doesn't. Um, I do see why with roofing and why that matters, um, so some but of the it, roofs, it, it's six and a half a dozen. It, yeah, it's not one system roofs, you still have, you have life in them, and you've actually paid for them. You, you've paid for this life that is still there, so there's no point in just going and, and, and getting rid of a good piece of roof. We, we understood Sorry. that some of the roofs were still under warranty. Um, I think there is one, one roof that could have still under warranty. We heard the one on the modular was under warranty, and is that the one you're thinking of? I don't know. I, it's Bill's lawn. Bill's lawn's got an area. I think that was my understanding. I can't say definitively that, but that was my understanding. So we would want to know these kinds of things. Kind of Can I ask a question? <clears throat> kind of from more of a practical standpoint. So um, for these targeted renovations or targeted system improvements, I'm looking at the sixth grade classrooms, um, which is where I'll be. And I have a question from my coworker who teaches science. And you know, typically in middle school science, you have a lab. So from what I heard, there wouldn't be really any new furniture for sixth grade. She was wondering if there was a, like if that would become a lab for her, so that she could actually do labs with her sixth graders. So I guess my question is kind of walk me through what does a targeted system improvement look like? Like what would that look like in those classrooms specifically? That's the first column. Um, <coughs> oh, that's which uh, classroom are you in? So I'm not in I'm in those grade. classrooms yet. We're Technically, right now, we're up in the top 
top left corner. But if we move, let's say that we are moving to these two classrooms, what would that look like? So in, in the current budget spreadsheet, um, those are under the full, it would have full system improvements, so new HVC, a new electrical, new lighting, new ceiling, but kind of everything you see and touch in the classroom would be the same. Now, that doesn't mean, and on, on every, furniture is a relatively inexpensive piece of this pie, and it, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying that you're not gonna have new furniture, because usually what happens in these processes are, he finds out he doesn't need to replace all the plumbing lines, so all of a sudden we've got budget that frees up that allows some other things to be added. So I, I don't wanna stand here and say that you would not get new furniture in this plan if it was done. Uh, but right now, there, there's not a um, budget of time for new furniture there. Are, are you talking about like a wet lab, like sinks and... So she was thinking sinks, tables, um, especially thinking about the kind of work she does with her sixth graders. So, so like an acid resistant surface. Mm -hmm. And even at that, so the current issue is having enough outlets to be able to plug in um, microscopes. So what would that look like? Would it be kind of a 21st century classroom? Um, we could look at that. Yeah, if you can do without the sinks, it's relatively inexpensive. It's not a big jump to those kinds of things. If you're looking for sinks and gas and um, acid uh, neutralizing plumbing, then it becomes more expensive. Um, we have more outlets in the additional. The foundational. Yes. Do we have more outlets than expanding. Yes. The All the in, in the foundational. All the outlet you would go, come up to code. You would have outlets out the walls. You would have you would determine where you wanted them. You would have the, the teaching tools like the projectors or the you know, that kind of it's stuff. The would, kind yeah, of. would be the power would be there. The infrastructure would be there. Maybe not the projector, but the right. power, the internet, the hookups, not the tools, yeah, the hookups. but the electric foundation to support. So we would still not have a smart class, but we would be Equipped ready. Right. And Mike, you were not saying that the current receptacles are not to code. You're just saying that there's not enough. And the, and the quantity. There's not enough. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying that they're electrically yeah. unsafe. I'm saying there's not enough. Exactly. I just want to throw out the list when we talked to Mike last Thursday on a Zoom call of things that we need more information on really to, to be able to drill down these numbers and make them mean something uh, relevant to what we need, uh, which was the coring of the roofs, uh, heating system pipes, which Mike, you said, depending on them and the condition of them, it would actually influence the kind of HVAC that you would be recommending. Right. So, we have, so this is just price here isn't really attached to a particular system no. right now. Okay. This price it basically is whatever we need to do. Right. And okay. if we have the infrastructure to do something else, it can be. Right. And then we talked about camera, uh, using a camera down the sewer and storm sewer. We talked about the electric system needing a deeper inspection, discovering what the water pressure is at the street, the gas pressure. And I guess my question is, I kind of thought this was what you would be doing at that depth, and maybe I misunderstood what, you know, uh, sure. how much the maintenance plan advisor would do. But it seems to me you can't really have a maintenance plan unless you have this information. So, so well, that's right. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a sewer machine with a camera. And so you guys, that's, so that's just the only There's a specialized okay. team that can do that. They have the equipment. Um, you have to be a licensed electrician to open up gear, and especially if it's hot. So that's something that I have to have this electrical inspector do. I mean, we looked at it all. We looked at it from the outside. But in, in terms of how um, how the system would, how long the system would last, he has to either de-energize it or open it up with an energized and evaluate it, uh, and then. Um, I do have a question. I know it's Jack Okay, I have a question about that because if you're recommending a full replacement of our electrical panels, why do we need to cover this? Um, there's a 
disagreement on the committee is to, uh, to whether we need to they don't like my recommendation <laughs> okay so there is a disagreement on the committee about whether or not we should go to 480 no that's not as much a recommendation it's, it's whether the um the older primary gear can, can, can be reused for how long okay and so that is why we, we would recommend an additional electrical inspection that comes at three thousand four hundred dollars so that we could see if we could retain the Vintage panels. Is that, is that, am I it's not vintage. It's not vintage. I mean, I'm reusing the words that you if, if they were probably, he probably shouldn't have used those words. Okay. Uh, well, that's well, there, there's some parts that we know do need to. We do yes. know some pieces definitely. Yeah, so the electric, so there's a lot of the old pushback electric panels, which is yeah. the way you're waiting for them. Yeah, so the electric panels are not the old pushback electric panels, which is way away from the stuff that, that, that we're arguing. We're talking main switches, the big, big switches, and they get very little use. They last forever in a day, and normally they, they they just don't wear out. So why would we pay to change them? Was there a point where an expert, where we would trust an expert opinion? Uh huh. Well, there's more experts here than one, and then different experts. I mean, the expert opinions. that we're paying for, and yeah. I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be facetious, but I feel like we went to great lengths to do an RFP to hire somebody. Yeah. But we to, and, and so. At some point, we have to say we, we are going to trust the opinion of the professional that we hire because this I, could be a never-ending. Well, the panels that are, this could be a never-ending. So, if you read the report, it says it was a visual inspection of those panels. So, so, like Mr. Lott said, they have not actually been opened up and checked to see what the condition is inside them. And, and opening them up and getting vandal inspection that's uh, thirty-four hundred dollars. That was one estimate, I think, that we were presented with. That doesn't mean everyone will charge them. Thirty-four hundred dollars. Thirty-four hundred dollars. But if we're saving thousands and thousands of dollars in our electric system, it seems to me. I mean, part of the reason we put the building professionals on the committee was so, so that they could have a knowledgeable interchange with our consultants, because uh, school board members are not electricians, do not know about uh, the, you know in depth information about buildings and building systems, that's part of the reason these folks over here and over there, you know, were added to the committee. Um, and it's it's not a question of distrust. I mean, I think there's, there's I'm sure there are different different experts with different opinions on these things, and we want to get the best opinion, and I think it's worth, if we don't spend this extra money, uh, which, I, I mean, I, again, I thought the maintenance plan advisor would have this expertise because I don't know how you get to a maintenance plan without that level of information. But, uh, but just to say, I, I think it's appropriate that these guys who have had a lot of experience um, have questions that we would look into those questions. May I ask a if quick we get, if question? If we get this inspection on the electrical, whatever, whether it's a, what is your guy or mm -hmm. another guy, we should be able to come back with it. He's gonna, said, yes, he's gonna give you a meter or replace them. He's or gonna be they're okay for right. some period of time. Correct. correct. And that period of time could be lengthy, correct? correct. We're not just talking five years. We'll, 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 we'll ask him all those questions. Yeah. Okay. I see Jack. Yeah, so I, I just want to make a comment on that because I also think before we keep spending more money to keep checking, I think we should look holistically at the scope of our need um, before we commit more money to investigating. So if we look at the whole scope of the entire project and it's an overwhelming amount, then do we continue to dump money into investigating? If we think that it's um, comparable where this renovation process makes sense, then I think it might be money well spent. My question is really for Mike. When we met, um, we talked about swing space and what this type of renovation would look like in terms of time. And you gave the 15 month timeline in summer school year with our students in a swing space of some sort in summer. If we phase this out in two parts, what does that do to this renovation timeline, swing space, disruption of learning? Uh, I'm not recommending a two-phase approach. No, so, I, so I'm not, so you're recommending yeah, I would a recommend, would do I would recommend a one-phase approach. The question for the, the community, the board, the facilities committee is, what's all in that phase? I, I'm not recommending a $25 million phase, and then three years later, you come through and do another $25 million phase. I'm not recommending that. Okay. 
Sorry, How did that might have question. come from where we asked to get right. more more divided up figures yeah, price as well? Price and, and I think that really is where it came from because because we've much bigger chunks with bigger prices on them, and we're like, whoa, you know, we've no idea of what we're talking about here. So that was your way of breaking it down. Yes. Yeah. So it was always looked at as one project. That was the way it was presented to us, and then and then we were going like, how do you come up with this square, foot, this price per square foot? How like where is this amount of renovation going? Where is that amount of renovation going? So that's how it actually got. got so if, I, if I'm following here, it's either we're looking at a foundational plan or at the whole thing, is that? No, I think you do the foundational plan and then you, you can add pieces of the, the other, as much as you can come up with to um, fall under the umbrella of whatever the community will support as far as money. So the foundational plan is, I don't want to say It may not even be good term out it. Yeah, I, I, so you, you, you want to get as much as you can get for the money that you want to put out. So that's, you know, it's, it's, you can pick and choose out of all these things what you need. To do. Some things you can, some but, things but, you have to do. But to meet all of the needs that were outlined by the administrators and the teachers, then that would be the one on the right, right? That would be the total organization. That's where we meet all of the needs that were discussed mm -hmm. here. These figures are still very, very much working numbers. I mean, when we were going through them, the other night. Some of them appeared to be a little bit on the high side, others maybe they were questionably low. I mean, they're, they're very, they're very uh, sort of guesstimates, I so, suppose. So I, I want to pause. I want to pause for my own sanity. Uh, I want to again revisit my question about is this a is this two parts of a whole or is this two separate plans and, and I probably misunderstood you Mike at first because I thought you were recommending a bifurcated approach like Oakwood. Now Oakwood already has the money because they have the health credit so that it's not like they have to go back for as much. And, and the reason I'm asking is this is very important when we talk about funding. So I just want to, want to think about that. And then as I look at the second part, my disappointment is in that is where all the educational adequacy concerns live. And so if I Agree with what you say, Judith, that these are indeed professionals, and I, I know that and don't doubt that. I have professionals who are bringing something to the table and did when Mike went through this timeline, and that's what got us mainly to what's in part two. So at what point do we get to address really the educational adequacy and the, question, the larger question, which is probably one for the board and the community to answer, is is that do, are we seeing educational adequacy as secondary to other things and, and it's not a question i can answer it's a larger question so i'm, I'm just a little disappointed that, that that most of the educational changes that we sat with you on are really um pushed to either the second half of a whole or part two of of a okay. two phase i have a Can question I, when I was saying that some of the figures are not quite there yet, or we don't understand them. So for instance, in the high school gymnasium, um, so window and glass replacements, 292,000. Don't think there's any windows in the gym. Also the doors. And, the, and the doors. Work. And then the doors, we've got 269,000. My, my guess is those are the windows and doors leading into the gymnasium and then are there not windows and doors separated. across it's, it's separated, separated, out separated out by the that's by why the we have questions we yeah, just have questions so yeah I, i'm just yeah you know yeah um, and there were other items like that that's that's what we're saying 
Yeah, like, it, it, my guess is it's about labeling that entrance because obviously there's like tonight I came in through the gym entrance and it's probably those doors. Uh, but yeah, but they're listing like 40 or 40 doors. And then they, uh, yeah, because then they list the other doors and windows. So. I got the question. Since we know in a, in terms of educational adequacy, we know a new build that middle and high school teachers will not have their own classrooms. So when we're thinking about the renovation, we're assuming teachers in the middle and high school will have their own classrooms. So um, because we already have that. So in terms of educational adequacy, um, if we're not having to build uh, extra classrooms and, and uh, Craig was going to speak to the modular issue, the modular, uh, the shoebox or modular units here, um, but before he does that, I'm just going to say, you know, we maybe wouldn't need that new construction if we, if we uh, did what we, in our current location, what we're going to do in a new build, which is the teachers are not going to have their own classrooms, so they'll be sharing classrooms, so you'll need less classrooms. Correct? Am I correct about that? It's not. It's not really a like for like. I think there's a misunderstanding of this idea that teachers don't have their own classrooms in new builds. Sometimes teachers don't have their own classrooms, and that's because there is a common space for teachers, because the classrooms are either um, a larger or, or designed to serve um, teaching and learning in ways that were not really thought of in 1952 or 1957. So it's not exactly a kind of a one-to-one, -one. we can just take these classrooms away. I don't know, um, I'm clearly not explaining it well. Um, can I, can I it's just not a one-to-one, -one, and I think maybe the two educators here can probably well, And I could tell you the space utilization, so if we're gonna take, so let's say we take four classrooms offline, during second period, I only have two classrooms available. To so it's not something that I can just take rooms offline and fill them in and have teachers travel to other classrooms. Some periods I have that space, other periods I just don't. So I, I don't think it's something that we could just demolish the shoeboxes and not replace those spaces if we didn't have the space. So when we look at total square footage from a design standpoint, we have a ton of hallways in this building. We have hallways in Mills Lawn. So in a new build, we can accomplish the same number of classrooms and lost square footage through the design. So I think that's I think that's an important piece to this. And, and I if if my understanding was right, the 2021 bonds that had every teacher having their own classroom. So I don't I, I don't recall teachers not having their classroom. Well, we have it I like Mike to speak to that. I, I don't recall that. So I was uh, requested in this process to do a comparison, a square footage comparison of the, um, the proposal, the addition renovation proposal to uh, what you theoretically could have gotten in the new K-12 plan. Um, and this is this is the, the document that compares the two relative to classroom space. Um, okay. Uh, the number of classrooms on, on the right column, it says the September 20 version, which is essentially essentially the same version. When you count up the number of classrooms, it's 43. And, and my best guess that the number of classrooms we've gotten in a new K-12 would have been around 29. Uh, and that total building was 105,000 square feet versus the 132,000 square feet. So there's, cons there's considerable less square footage and you can't say all that square footage is just in corridors. There would be some classroom reduction. Now the final, like what you, the final number of classrooms you would have gotten would have needed to have been explored through a programming exercise. Um, if you wouldn't have done the second gym in a K-12, you could have picked up a bunch more classrooms. So there would have been some trade-off discussions that, that would have needed to occur. Uh, but there, there are differences uh, between the renovation and the new in terms of Kind of the size of uh, what you're getting. I think we should go through and look at the redundancies too, because if we share a building, there like on the renovation plan there will be redundancies versus one control building, right? Like right room. Um, we have 
Yeah, yeah. So the, we, I think that would be important. And also, looking at the spaces that are on this plan that are actually just dead space. I don't think that when you're seeing it every single day, you see all of that dead space that is not able to be used for learning at all. It's just there. So I think that it would be, I don't know, I think it would be important for us to take a look at that and actually look at the square footage if people are really worried about it to see how much of that is actually dead space and that is not being used for them. Well, if we have all this dead space, why are we adding, why are we adding new construction? Because it's not, it's, so if you look at our end of the um, building where our classrooms are, all of this space here, dead space. It can't become a classroom. It's not, I mean, we'd have to tear down walls if we wanted to do that. That would be more expensive. Um, if you look, let's see here. This is an all classroom here where this library is right now. The way that this opens up right here, that's all dead space going to this corner. That's just, that's space that's not used. So, I mean, I'm there every single day. I see the space that isn't used that can't easily be configured to a new classroom because it's just in an awkward place because of all the times we've added on and built new walls up and put took, taking the walls down. It's just not, I mean, if you ask any teacher in my area about all the dead space, they'll be able to tell you about that. It's not in our classrooms, it's outside of our classrooms. Was that communicated to Mr. Richley? I mean... Well, I think part of the issue, because there used to be restrooms there so, on those on the are you talking about the landing so, where entrances to all the classrooms are yeah so that whole space i mean there's a lot of that space there those restrooms are not restrooms anymore they're storage which is right. a good thing that's a positive thing but if you're coming in where the steps are here there's a wall there where the computer lab is and that whole entire area is like there's a copier there that's it. And some shelves and some like broken furniture and stuff. It's not usable space. And even at that, if we're trying to use it for kids, um, we can set them out there, but there's classes going on in the library, so it's noisy. It's not really a quiet space if you want to use it for a small group space. See, that would be a great small group space if it had built-in walls and stuff, but it doesn't. So that's what I'm trying to get at is well, that... Yeah, it was built as a corridor is what it was. That's how when... When that whole thing was reconfigured way back when they made it into a computer lab, I don't know what it is now, but it still is a computer lab. Yes, but they put up, we put up temporarily, temporary walls, mm -hmm. semi-permanent walls to break it up so that kids could access their classrooms in the morning. So it's a hallway is what it, what it was meant to be originally. Um, if this extended corridor is put on, then it will become a hallway again. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, obviously, you, we could, if that's in deep renovation, that could be a solid wall all the way up, so as, as opposed to maintaining. Yeah. I think I appreciate Mike's spreadsheet, but I just want to caution us. He guesstimated the number of classrooms because when you go through a project, you do have to do a whole new series of exercises. We never got that far, right? And there is a give and take. Spaces. But when I say educational adequacy, it's more than square footage. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about Oakwood, and, and it was a, I'm glad I went on that visit, but we also went to bring it. And so when I hear educational adequacy, I see a section of a building that has maybe three first grade classrooms, and all of the doors have glass in them, and the, the space in front has a graduated stage for performances. They have a uh, media center that is distributed throughout the whole building. So there is a corresponding, what I would call a little library. There are, um, there's embedded technology in the classroom. That's what I think of also when I, when I say educational matters, not just um, square footage. I'm just wondering if we should hear. Um, I think we need to think about next steps uh, on the renovation on the renovation plan that we are going to complete. Um, so uh, I'm wondering though if we want to let the citizens 
speak a bit here um, and then come back here to kind of think about it. Dorothy, I think you were going to speak. You had a comment. Before. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to echo some things that are important to me as a parent, too. Is that, like Harry has pointed out, all the floor plan changes that we want to see for a 21st century teaching is pushed back to the second plan, right? And that's something that I think is really impactful to our children, right? Right now, we have moved since the 50s, we have moved into a student-centered learning, and usually that involves having a space for a small group that is in the eyesight of the teachers. And I, I got that. I think that's the, that was the takeaway that I got from the uh, Ohio School Board Association meeting, is that we saw different renovation plans, we saw different new build, and the difference between a renovation and a new build is that we had a student-centered learning in the new build in a way that is difficult to make it happen here. Um, so a square footage, a square foot is not equal everywhere in a building. If we want to have small group spaces, which I understood from your plan is that it's pushed back to the second plan, it would have to be within eyesight of the teachers. And with all the corridors and hallways that we have, we really don't have that here. Unless we get to the total renovation plan of the additional that reworks the floor plan. So it is problematic to me if we're looking at a foundational plan that doesn't include a floor plan reward. It's really limiting what our teachers can do. It's really limiting the experience that our kids can have. Because we do want them, especially after COVID, we want them to have the experience of doing small work, small group work. And I'm not sure that we would get there without a big discussion about the floor plan. So I don't want I don't want us to come out of this meeting and think that systems are the answers and the floor plan is not, because it's really both here. Mm -hmm. Citizens. I had a question regarding the electric. Um, when you were discussing um, that certain things aren't good to piece together, like HVAC, when we talk about getting another estimate on electric work, how does electric fit into that? Is it? Is it easy to piece together, or is that something that generally is going to work best to go in and do the full system? I, well, um, generally, if the primary gear, which is the, the electrical gear, just past the transformer, right, the utility duke or whoever your utility is, <coughs> the transformer wires run into the building, and there's a large primary piece of electrical gear that um, may or may not have a transformer in it that, that pushes the electricity then to secondary and distribution gear. If that first piece is large enough in terms of capacity and modern enough that it is very easy to expand. Right? You have to have capacity, you have to have enough amps to, to distribute, and then um, you have to be able to connect. But all <laughs> electrical gear is generally interoperable. So if it's made by Siemens or Square D or whoever it is, the code requires that they all play together. Now there are some exceptions, right. but by and large. Now in this case, you have, I won't say the word vintage, but you have an older piece of primary gear that is limited in its size. There's a, there's a capacity rating plate. That's all you're allowed to connect to it. You can't over-connect. And there's a, there's a code and there's math you do to determine how much you can connect. And uh, that's what you have. So. It, it, Again, yeah, our, our, our estimation that that gear is too old and inadequate size-wise, but there's a professional disagreement, and I'm trying not to be defensive, and I'm okay with that. We every every project. No, I'm just designed, trying to look at the big picture. There's people that disagree that are equally capable of. of you know, so. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Cindy. Um, so. Uh, around this oh, issue, you introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, Cindy C. I'm a resident here for a long time. Um, so I hear this issue of, uh, you know, that, that the space is more than just the, you know, the educational experience is part of the space. I'm wondering with the OFCC plan, which, as I understand it, they allot us 105 square feet based on the number of students we have. 105,000. 105,000 square feet. <laughs> right. That's an important number. Um, so will we see a, num uh, a floor plan? Will we see plans like this if we go with a new build so that we can make that same comparison and know 
that we have those same considerations that can fit in 105 square feet? Mm -hmm. 105,000. Yes, but yeah. anyway, will we see with an OFCC endorsed build? Will we see floor plans? We didn't last time. We did with the very first levy. Some. Will we see a floor plan that allows us to make to answer the kinds of questions that you're raising now? Do you, I, I can take part of it. Do you want to? I, I guess I I'm gonna try to rephrase your question. Would you see a floor plan before eleven? Is your question with an OFCC project? That is uh, that your question? Well, well she wants to compare it. Yeah, I mean, I, if if I were deciding on what levy to offer, I would want to know, right? That I would want to know your options. My options. I would want to know which ones address the kind of needs that Canada is raising. Okay. For can sure. I, can I respond? Um, in the the very first levy attempt, when we had a renovation and expansion plan for just this building. Um, the way they did the wings for 7 and 8 and then 10 and 12 and 9 and 11 was a, a larger open space in between each wall of classrooms, teacher workrooms, so that we had the space close to what, what we are doing. And it did look like what we were talking about now, which is a, a different structure of not just a hallway with classrooms flanking it, you know, a six foot hallway. It was that open space where there were tables in the courtyard between two walls of classrooms where there can be that small group space that is visible um, from the classroom teacher. And yeah, the, the, the first set of drawings Mike Richley did for that first levy, as a teacher that works in the building, it, it looked very pleasant. You know, <laughs> it, it looked right, like it met, right. checked a lot of boxes. So. Right, that was not condensing. There, there are a couple of differences. You're correcting me if I'm wrong. 2017, it was not a 2018 when it was on the ballot. It was not an OFC project. So, Mike did drawings that were, I'm not going to say high detail, but some detail. When you become an OFCC project, you are given, based upon your enrollment, a whole set of, um, I'm going to say, criteria that square footage criteria based upon your enrollment. So all of these from 2017 um, on, it's all on the website. So having gone through this experience at Wentwoods, I can tell you that we did not have drawings to take to the public for um, a balance sheet. We did know that we were gonna go from six buildings to two. So there might have been some um, broad brush like exterior buildings, but the whole footprint what the classrooms look like after you have an approved project and the voters approve it, then there's a, a whole series, months, maybe even a year long, of community meetings and, and as Mike said, you know, you, you have these programming meetings and there's the Ohio School Design Manual, which is available online, that really dictates a lot of what's required in which type of space. Does that, does that answer your question? Um, well, does it? I mean, no. The, are you saying no? We will not see drawings. I'm saying for you are not going to see a complete a fourth floor plan for a valid issue for a new project. Okay. We were going to see that, that the, whole, the whole report, like we've seen before, that lists square footage, that lists square footage by area, etc. You know, Mike does this for a living. He might have something else to add, but yeah. The, it, well, uh, I mean, you're. Uh, you're, you're generally correct. The, the challenge with the USFC process is they co-select the architect after the bond issue passes. So if you're doing a lot of design work with a pre-bond architect, it's, you're taking some risks by doing that. But Which is why you generally don't have plans. Yeah. Because any project that big has to go out to bid. Yep. And that's yeah, I would just say that the OFCC, you know, they're offering this money, but it but it comes with red tape. There, there's a set of rules. You got to play by their rules, and part of that is that, like I said, when you go out to bid, it's square footage numbers, but right there's there's no drawing of a building. There's which does make it very difficult as far as 
okay, like I have nothing to see. I'm just voting on square footage and numbers. Um, but that's their process. But in, um, in general, you can, you're told, hey, if you want this, if you want a 200 seat auditorium, it's not fitting in this project. So you know those things. I, I guess the beauty of a project like that is that you get to, as a community, students, teachers, parents, you get to co-create what that building looks like, what that floor plan looks like, what's important to the community. Perhaps it's more important to the community to have a black box theater than a second gym. Those are type, the types of decisions that you can make because you you just have to fit it. In the yeah, and I, I would just say if you if you want an idea of what an OFCC project would look like, then the best thing you can do is, is go to buildings that are recent, that are OFCC projects, that are new builds, and that's the best way to get an idea of what would an OFCC project look like here. Um, because those design features happen in the process. You have to have the money before you start going that way. But, but there are restrictions, right? There, um, right, there, there are certain things that if you want, um, they're not included. Those are, those are LFIs. Um, locally funded. But there are locally funded initiatives. That, uh, so like you can include them in your project, but it would not. What would you say? Oh, I was just, the kind of restrictions that, that Kineta was talking about, not restrictions, but the kind of changes that you were talking about, those are not included in restrictions. They don't, do they go at that level? Maybe this is, maybe I'm no, getting too I, I, Sorry, Cindy, I'm trying to answer, I'm trying to answer your question. I, I, there are, let me give you one example. We'll fund a stage but not seats, right? Why is that? Students don't use the seats. Adults use the seats. Students mm -hmm. do use the stage. So that's the type of yeah. thing. But it's all spelled out. I mean, so, and, and I'm happy to talk to you. Okay. Talking about renovation. Um, so my name is Ashley Folkruth. I spoke at the last board meeting. Um, I have two students at Mills Lawn, and I'm also the fifth grade teacher who currently occupies the flex space that's on that map right now. Um, my concern about not doing deep renovations is my classroom needs it. It's blatantly true. Um, see the little box that's by the flex space? That's currently a girl's bathroom that has a faux door that used to work, but they kind of blocked it up, sort of. Um, but I can hear children going to the bathroom in the middle of my class because it has no sound. When we do map testing, district testing, I have to close that bathroom because the flushing of the toilet is so loud. So the fact that that's not being renovated bothers me because I'm in that space. Or the fact that it is December, I don't even know. I had to have my windows open today because it was literally 85 degrees in my classroom. 85 degrees. Um, because the heat is so much and my kids were complaining that it was so hot in my room. Um, I have children that play sports and they said we went to Green Inn today and I was like you did and they're like why can't we have that? I don't know. I had kids at recess today on blacktop only and the smell coming from the cafeteria which is natural gas whatever it is why does it stink? I don't know. When are they going to fix it? I don't know. Um, let's talk about the space between the four and the flex. That is currently on the top in IS's room, which is probably not that big most of the time. Most of probably have the bathroom that size. That's where our children go to get special services. They're sent to the top of the stairs in a room where the windows are at knee level and kind of hidden away. We don't, you know, we're going to shut that door. Underneath her is another space which leaks when it rains to the point where there's a couple inches of water and that's where our mental health counselors, our OT kids, speech, go to sit. So that space to me is not usable. I don't even, we, I just don't even understand. Um, so if you really want to know, like the experts, talk to the teachers. Like she said, we're there every day. I'm with my kids every day. My argument is not for me. I'm an adult. I can. Go with the best of them, go with the flow, whatever. My kids deserve better. They really do. Our students, my own children, what am I breathing every day? I have this like filter thingy that I have to keep plugged in and running constantly. Because if I don't, my room smells like a toilet. 
So tell me, when you go to an office and you're at work, do you have to hear people going to the bathroom? Do you have to smell people going to the bathroom? Do you have to have a vent running constantly to get that smell out of your classroom? Well, I see these numbers and that's great, but all I think about is my students. All I think about are my kids. Those are not numbers to me, those are my kids. And they don't have a voice and that's really concerning for me. It's very, very concerning. This is scary as a teacher to talk in front of the public. But I, if I can't fight for my kids, what's the point? So we need to really think about flex, that's fifth grade children. That is not flex, that is fifth grade kids. Since we don't have a complete renovation plan yet, I think it's good for us to hear about the concerns. And, and you can always come and like, some people like, to me, like seeing it when it's being used with the students. Nobody questions what you're saying about these things and what can be done about it. <coughs> Too, but I think, like I said, we're not actually done with the renovation plan yet, so we don't actually know exactly what will be in, involved. Knowing that there's that need there means that we need to address it. That's the way I see it. And um, so we need to figure out how to do that. But we got to get these numbers in better shape before we know what kind of money we actually have. And we didn't say $25 million is the baseline numbers that need to be worked. But that's not necessarily where we end. Then you have. Then we're going to have to have a conversation at the school board, the way I see it, or maybe we're going to decide as a committee. We're going to. Act. Some things are essential. We're going to have to add on. Okay. And, and so also, that's, that's kind of the way. I've worked in new buildings. Like my previous district was brand. Like I worked in a building that was 100 years old, and they brand brand new OFCC building, brand new. Okay. And we talk about the flex space and the teachers not having classrooms. That was actually dictated by the principal. We had the space, but the principal thought, well, you know what, these two ELA classes would work really well in side by side. Our walls opened up, garage doors went up, and we could have this flexible space for our kids to learn and grow. Our small group room, like Dorothy said, was in eye shot so they could go work. They had couches, they had all these beautiful things for our kids to learn. And so if you want to know what that stuff, I did it for seven years. Like again, we have the experts in our buildings too. I may not be an expert on mechanical stuff, but when it comes to education, I know what I'm doing. I promise that they wouldn't have hired me if I didn't. So that's all I have to say. Uh, me or okay. Linda? Okay, me? Hi. Right. I'm Eunice Brevik. Um, I'm a parent of several kids in the district. I'm also an educator, but not in this district. Um, when I think about this and I'm looking at the numbers, I mean, given all that we've been talking about, if somebody came and told me four walls, <clears throat> here's your price to insulate four walls. That's an expert opinion. I think we can trust that expert. That's fantastic. Another expert might be able to come in and say, only one wall needs insulation replaced. Yet that cost that the first expert gave you is going to go down dramatically if only one of those walls needs insulation. I think the community has spoken twice. And we owe it to them, whether we're happy, disappointed, angry, whatever emotion came up based on the levy, people have said we're only willing to dish out so much money. Um, my understanding that this committee's charge is to get an accurate sense of the numbers involved so they can go to the community and ask for money. Um, and I think some things, like we were talking about the roof, for example, we really won't know unless you take those core samples. There's several things that need to be dished out. Like the numbers that are up there are expert numbers, and that's great. But those expert numbers might shift based on what's necessary. So I think there, there seems like there's a little bit more information that needs to be gathered before we could go back to the community and the voters and say, here's, here's the, the deal. Because I think if you go up there and you tell them $50 million to renovate, that could really set off a storm of misinformation and be misleading in terms of what's absolutely necessary. And, and, I, and I agree with everything that people have said in terms of wanting a space that is beautiful for our kids and they deserve wonderful things. Uh, but I think we still need a little bit more. Let me get a comment back to that. Just And I see you back there sitting there. But one of the big advantages, and I'm not saying it'll happen at all, but one of the big advantages of the renovation is, is that we've X number of dollars to do it after a levy's passed, whatever that amount is. And if, if you look at the previous big bills in the village, we had the fire station went way over budget. By the time they got the levy, they got a design, they started building, they were, I think, a million over budget. So about about 20%, that's huge. Then um, we had the water treatment plant. That went way over. That's why the water's so expensive. 
My understanding is one of the schools in Fairborn, same thing. They they haven't finished the school. They're out of money. And um, I think you mentioned to me one day a, lot, a while back that there are other projects like that. So if we had actually gone ahead and passed the first levy, we might actually have a school two-thirds, three-quarters built that we do not have the money to finish out. One of the big pluses that I see on doing a rehab is, is that if, if the cost of construction went way high, and we have no idea what it's going to do, but I mean, it has been nuts crazy for the last couple of years, we at least wouldn't get left with a three-quarter built building out here, no money to finish, and still have two buildings that we have to upkeep. So, I don't know, that would just be one of my feelings on it, but you're right, the, these figures could go anywhere. We really want to try and get them nailed down so we can see what, how much can we do for the limited, probably limited money that you know, the village is, is prepared to, or can come up with. I mean, when you look at Oakwood, a very ex, you know, exclusive area in town, and they, they had to sort of struggle to get 18 million, we're talking way more, and we're a small village. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna gonna add on there. Renovations can go over budget too, which yeah, means that stopped. which means that um, when some of those projects, part of the renovation, goes over budget, then some of those other items get cut from the list. Yeah, but at least you've still got a school that you can go to. You, I mean, you, not a fit project isn't finished. If, if our okay, kids are out of the building and, and we can't finish it, then. Okay, so I guess my point is I'm a mother and a teacher. I work at the school at Mills Lawn. So we're not going to get it. We don't want a new build. What is your timeline on telling us when we can get the renovation money? While you're pushing numbers around and we're going all nitpicky, I've got orange stuff coming from the ceiling at Mills Lawn. I've got the teacher's lounge where they can't plug in a coffee maker and a microwave to make their lunch and get their drink at lunchtime because it'll run, it'll blow the electric. So we're talking and we're talking and we're talking and everybody, the kids are suffering. We're suffering in the buildings because you want to nitpick on the line items and we need to make a decision. So when is your, when is your time that you're going to say this is the money that I agree on, that this is what we're the going to put to the school board is going to make that decision. It will be, we're hoping to make it by May so that we can put something on the levy in, uh, on a, uh, in the fall that it will come up. Okay. I hope so because I came to this community because of valued education. I decided to live here and all the levies since my kids have been in school have not passed. So my kids like go to sports and they're like, why do we have it? My teenage boys are like the shoebox is gross. Teenage boys are gross. If they know the shoebox is gross, it's gross. I have my youngest wants to leave the school. He's like, why can't we just move? I don't want to be here anymore. So that's what's happening to our kids. That's who this building But the buildings are for the kids. It's not for the kids. Me? What's your name? Okay, yes. Liz. Liz. My name's Liz. <laughs> yeah. so, um, I just had a question about, like we had, met, we had talked about the foundational renovation versus the additional work and whether or not that's the right way, thing to call it or what. But how, like, how are we deciding that? And I think Dorothy's point earlier about like how were those decided? Because why are we breaking it into two? If this is the renovation that is needed, the total amount of costs, like why even break it up? Um, because I think if we're gonna sh like show the public what exactly we need, it's a little. It I think it's you can't call something foundational without you know the perception from the public that oh well that's that's going to make things right well not necessarily because we can't you know do the storm shelter properly until phase two so that actually would have to, if we're only doing one that would have to be in the foundational right if that was part of like a requirement or something or the hazardous abatement you can't break it that into two separate things if we're not doing both of them right or he's shaking his head is that not true or no no, we just talked about that a couple of minutes ago, and it's just the way they broke it down because we asked for more detailed figures. But why into like two it's, separate? They just divided it up that way. But it, but it, but it was never discussed by any of us as two construction projects. I think maybe it's helpful to think of it as like high priority 
and extra. And I have disagreements about oh. what should be in the high priority, and maybe we all do, but I think that's what I'm seeing it. This is like the must do, and this is the other. And I think a lot of the other needs to move into the must do, but yes. that's right. my opinion, and that's the conversation. Um, I Could you say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't say your Sorry, I'm Naomi. Okay. Bunch of yeah. And I'm uh, Rebecca Potter, and I, I have two daughters who graduated, class of 20, class of 22, doing well. Um, so I uh, have just a few things to point out, uh, and I am coming here with the real hope to pass a levy in the fall, and understanding, having my two daughters go through, and we've heard it from the teachers, how, um, yeah, we need a new, we need to fix these problems, we, we need to, to address the schools. Um, I am worried about two things that I don't think are getting enough attention. Uh, the first is is that in the first levy there was really only one thing that I saw people agreed on and it was to keep two schools. And in the second levy uh, attempt I found more people objecting to the single school idea than the cost. Uh, of course both were a strong concern but in terms of what people were saying, what my neighbors were saying, signs on their lawns. Um, I, I just, I, I teach rhetoric and then in sustainability and we're trying to figure out how do you shift opinion. I'm very concerned that unless that's addressed very aggressively, this will be a hard sell to the community. Uh, especially because we also are, are aware of the demographics, so we are not a growing school. Um, in fact, we're hearing a lot of messaging about our housing costs, our aging population, etc. And we know that that's going to be a harder constituency to get to vote for a school levy. Um, so please understand that, we're, as I think Terry said, we're not comparing a, a apples to apples and that a two-school plan is not going to be looked at as the same as a K-12 through plan, especially as Cindy indicated, we can't see it, right? We, and that's not what we know, it's not what we've experienced. I'll try to get out to Greenan, but most of us don't know it. We also know enough about the state to know that with a small school, we might not get half of what we hope for. And so this is my question uh, to Mr. Richley. Is it at all possible to renovate the two schools and give the teachers what they want? for 50 million or less is do you think that could happen that's what i presented okay so that can happen that's a great place to start and i really and i really hope that we do see this as a great first step thank you thank you especially to the building experts who are volunteering your time thank you so much um, this community is full of experts, and I would agree with many that Mr. Motz, you did it, or Motz uh, did engineering. engineering. Sorry. Like uh, sorry, Mr. Murdoch. No worries. You did a, you, you've given us a great start. As a taxpayer for 30000 I'd like to see more detail included in that price, like the core and testing the pipes and the electrical. If it's not included in the price, I encourage you all to do it because. For example, I look at a $28,000 water heater. The village is going to look at a $28,000 water heater, and they're going to start to already dig in their heels and say, this isn't an honest effort. So I'm it's throwing. It's water heaters, pumps, and pipe, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, industrial. Um, so it, it, and if, if that detail is shown, right? Then you can have some experts come in and say, well, tankless water heaters will probably get you what you want and you won't have the energy cost to fund it. So these are the kinds of conversations that this community needs to have to get the buy-in, listen to the teachers, make sure we get you what you want, and maybe it's more than 25 million, but also listen to the community and our building experts try as hard as we can to get as accurate numbers as possible and work collectively towards a decision. I feel that a really good renovated school 
will win a levy. I'm just not so confident about the other option. Can I, can I speak to that? Yep. I'll just take a second. So thank you, Rebecca. You know, when I first came, I, I think there's some, not I think, I know there's this belief in the community that I um, go to bed at night thinking about a new school, and that's my plan. When I came in, I was given the directive to address facilities, and I was told cost is the issue. The most economical plan was a new building because of that credit, right? Do I think two campuses fully renovated, there is that, I don't want to make that descriptive, two campuses fully renovated would give us what we need and, and maybe a little more than a new building because of the uh, square footage? Yes. But then I have to step back and think, if cost is the issue, now we have a $50 million project with no up credit. And I say that, saying that in, in Jay and I had this very conversation this afternoon. You know, if I could call the OFCC and say, hey, you know, we're special, give us a waiver to do this. Um, I'm willing to do that. I don't think they're willing to move because they come at it with, uh, with cost in mind, right? And so given that student enrollment, single building is what they recommend. And, and they fund single buildings of 1,200, 1,300, 1,500 kids. So um, it's not like we're anywhere near the edge. So I get it because I, I do, I now know that cost I don't think was the issue. It is an issue, but I don't think it was the issue. So I, I say that to say thank you for your comments. I, I don't know where this puts us, but I think it's, it's an important community conversation. What we all know is that our facilities need addressed and they don't just need a I have a question, actually, really quick, just to pose to the community, it doesn't need to be answered right now, but if teachers support a K-12 building, and you're saying you want to support teachers, if the teachers look at both of these plans and say, we prefer the new build, would you support the teachers in that, or would you prefer to go with what you want as, as a community member who doesn't work in the building? That's a question, because I very specifically remember writing out letters with my fellow union members about supporting the levy. And so that's kind of, kind of going back to the idea of we are, we're supporting what our teachers want. Um, that's the question that I do have, and then also if we're going back to the plan, I'll be very honest, our teachers did put in input for these buildings, um, but it was kind of, it wasn't like this is our first option or this is our first choice. So I just want to let people know that, that even with these renovations, even with these additions, I think that if you ask teachers what their ideal classroom looked like, it wouldn't look like what's in here. I'm just being very honest, and I felt like that needed to be said. I, I know other people back there have mentioned that. That's just what I'm, I wanted to say. So. Can I just make a reply to a comment you made about the 30000 <coughs> uh, paid to uh, Mott's Engineering? That actually was something that we asked for, because we'd all spent ages going through it, looking at it, but we, we, couldn't, get a, we couldn't get a total focus onto it. And the only way we could do it was to get someone like them to come and actually give us this breakdown. Whether it's slightly high or slightly low, that's sort of immaterial, really. It was to, it, we, we had to reduce it, or we'd have spent months and months before we ever could even vaguely get to this sort of money. So, so this really has been super helpful, and, and, it's, and it's brought, it's, it's given us all something to chew on and to sort of whittle on and see where we can go from it. But no, I mean, maybe it would be nice if we got a little more info or something, but really it, it, it has been a big help to everyone here. Thanks for that uh, clarification. Okay. Seems then it might be worthwhile to get the additional information that you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, almost quarter to nine, and I know we need to think about next steps uh, so that we can leave this proceedings knowing the work we have to do. Um, 
but if people want to give a one Laura minute comment, I think Laura, Laura was first, yeah. and then maybe yeah. Dino, and then you. Laura. One minute. Village resident, a uh, child graduated from here, and I'm a former teacher. And I, first of all, thank you for all your hard work. I, I would vote for this renovation, 50 million in a minute. I've been running some numbers here, and there's numbers. This community has said twice, we don't like that number. We're not willing to give you that money. I think you should do focus group with different constituencies and say, just what can you afford? If we're going to raise your taxes next year and for many years, it would be 500 a year, 1,000. Just for me personally, running these numbers, based on what the auditor says, my property's worth not about $1,500. So that's kind of shocking to people who have to vote for this levy. So just keep that in mind. If I could, I'd give it to you. But I, I think the and I also think the communities said we want two campuses. Thank you. Do you have a lot of just a quick question about when it comes down to you've talked about the numbers, but we really didn't get to the hard numbers about when it comes time, there's gonna be a 15 month, which you probably know it's gonna run, run a little bit longer. Where are you gonna locate the kids? How much is that gonna be? How much is it gonna to take to book the bus drivers, the diesel, all that all those inclusive numbers, because that's another added fee that we don't know that we would like to know with the renovations that are going on. So that's something that we would probably like to look a little more in depth on. Go ahead. I actually have Say a, your name. Gary. Gary Saramski. Um, a very quick question, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> um, if the two if the two school approach, the renovation we've been talking about, if it comes in short of what the state uh, considers qualifies for um, a you know the twenty seven percent or whatever, what's the threshold that we're short on? Is it enrollment in each of the it's buildings? It's enrollment, and, and they they take a historical look. So anytime you're in an OFCC project, they do enrollment projections, and our last ones are online, and um, they go by building and then by district. Okay. So, so, so we couldn't like grab fifty kids. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, what would it need to be at in order to um, qualify for the state money? And what are we projecting we will likely be at? So we qualify for state money for a single K twelve. Right, right, right. Twenty seven percent. Okay, but but no, for two schools though. So here's they, they have two thresholds. So one is enrollment. So it's I'm going to say between 350 and 375. 350. Let's say 350. Okay. Unless your building enrollment is 350, they will not fund that. That's that's piece one. The second piece is what they call the renovate to replace ratio. Uh, Feel free to step in and correct me. So when that is high, yeah. if it is over a certain percentage, they it's their opinion that it is much less expensive to replace than renovate. And so we okay, have those yeah. two things working right, against right. us. Because our renovate to replace ratio is quite high. Yeah. And if you go on the website and look at our old, um, old last year, uh, OFCC um, documents, it will say the ratio right on the first page. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we're, we should end shortly, so um, I'd like to suggest next steps that we work these numbers and that we have another Zoom call with you, Mike, with your building. And um, if we want to, with Mike, and we can only have seven people at a time talking to these guys, so we're going to have to break down if everybody in the committee wants to speak to them or any people past. Is that if the numbers pass seven? And during those meetings, is that when we would? Uh, make a case about what should be in the foundational or the alternative. When are we discussing what is left now? Um, well, I think I think we should. We can have. We said we would have different price points, so we can have the foundational was supposed to cover all needs. It doesn't include all the needs. I know. So, I'm, I'm not sure why that is because I thought it did. Um, but and I think it should. So, so those numbers are not. But quite. we don't have. We don't have core samples, so we don't know what they're going to cost. <laughs> so there's that problem. I, I mean, 
I, I feel very comfortable with the numbers presented today um, from Oates and Ridgely. Um, I understand that to narrow things down, that there's more investigative cost. Um, the board agreed to spend the 50000 that, that we've done so far to get here. Um, if you want to narrow it down and, and get more answers, then you, we're asking for more investment. And I think if we're going to ask for more investment, should the school board. we should ask the board yes. how much more they want to invest in this process. Because <coughs> there's a lot of information here that can be used to present to the board and, and for the board to make a decision. Um, I know that the community has, has differences of, of opinions, um, but I, I think that we have pretty good numbers here. We have a pretty good idea. Do we want to keep investigating this? Is cost the number one issue? Is two schools the number one issue? Um, I, I think that there's a lot of people that have differences of opinions on that. So I, I think there might be those questions, I think, are bigger than, than perhaps, you know, the details of how much of the roof needs to be replaced. It's it's not going to it's it's not going to knock these numbers in half. Um, it's just it, it's going to slightly narrow things. Um, so when you know if we decide to pursue this further, the, then that's when I think we should invest this cost. But um, I think we should go to the board. Do we want to invest more cost into this process, or or do we just want to? try to narrow this down a little bit. Why don't we at the next meeting talk about we should be in what we think of the foundational. I, I agree, I think all the groups, but we, again, <clears throat> I personally don't feel we're going to have good enough numbers to um, really be able to say to the community this is what's going on. So I would like to see that extra money. But we're going to ask the school board, this community does not have that authority to you know spend more money so we'll bring it to the school board. I agree. Um, Scott, did I see your finger? Uh, you did. I, 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 my two cents worth and that's exactly what it's worth uh, is that uh, I completely agree that we do need to get more information. We, we've got to drill down on some of these costs. However, I want to say that time is money, the clock is ticking, and especially in times of inflation and rising construction costs, um, we cannot afford to drag this out and be subject to analysis paralysis, or the, the costs will far outstrip any any savings we're going to make by digging into this and looking at where we can save, you know, fifty or hundred thousand dollars. It's not that we shouldn't save those those amounts, but we owe it to this community to get something done and, and get it. it get it out there and uh, if, if there's more that we can do the board needs to tell us what it, what do they need to make this decision what will they accept to put things in perspective we all realize that something needs to be done sooner rather than later so so everyone understands the <clears throat> earliest possibility to put a put a uh, something on out for a vote is November of next year and I'm not mistaken we have until June to get that on the ballot it depends it, it depends so there's some yeah. ballot deadlines depending upon what we're going to put on the ballot mm -hmm. so I think you're in the general area but it, it, it just so we, we're happy to share that they may even be up on the website okay so Let's, let's just say we have until June to make a decision on what we're going to put on the ballot. We also need to realize there are three there are three different parts to this. One is that the board could decide to do a, a foundational program. And let's say it's $25 million. That can be accomplished probably within a couple years after the levy is passed. Uh, if we decide to do the, the full renovation, that could probably be done within three or four years after the levy is passed. 
if the decision is made to go to a new school, nothing gets done because we're not going to put money, we're not going to throw good money after bad money in, in working, doing significant work on the existing schools, and a new school won't be available for five years. That's just a time perspective that people need to get their, get their heads around. It's, it's about three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's about three. That's not what Green No, we have to wait for the levy. There's a year of design. You got to go out for bid, and then you got to construct the project. Four years from today. Four years from today. Okay. Three years from now. Are we all in agreement? Are we in agreement that the foundational and the uh, additional work will happen before a new school could happen before a new school is ready? Okay. And would we That's be looking at one make. levy? Or are we looking at one letter? And that would cover one phase Whatever one. Whatever the board two. decides to do, uh, if they want to go foundational for a lesser amount, or the whole, the whole so enchilada we're, so for we're in the middle. The big for the big amount. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything further to? So I think um, the next. I'm not sure what to do about it. I think we should look at some other, if there's other things that need to be added, I agree all the roofs need to be addressed one way or another as part of the foundational um, plan. Um, what about the educational adequacy? The floor plan? Well, like I said, I mean, we know Oakwood is working out of a 1920s building and they've got, they're doing very well at your school. So I'm saying, I'm just saying, um, it will depend on, you know, cost and what people think is essential. Can we just <laughs> acknowledge that we're not Oakwood, though? We're not Oakwood. Nobody said we were, but I'm just saying, they, they're working on what we're doing. They're doing traditional work, basically. And they, they're, they're very different than we are. So, educationally, I think we can... All right, I think we should go ahead and close the meeting. And uh, thank you, everybody, who stayed and just participated. Appreciate it. Thank you.